uh, we were just sitting here going, all right, when did we first run into each other? I remember where it was. It was at the South Gate uh, at, at General Conference, uh, straight across from what used to be Crossroads Plaza, which ha- has changed greatly. Uh, it's, it's no longer there. It's no longer there. I don't know how they did that. That tells you how long it's been since I went to uh, Temple Square. Uh, but we met at conference, and I will uh, go ahead and start and tell you right now that one of the spiritual experiences that I had at conference was the first time that I ran into Alma because I had an immediate, um, I believe, spiritually directed recognition. Um, Rich, is, Rich is, I'm actually getting a message saying 1988. I, I think it was, uh, I, I, that, you know, it could be, I don't know. Um, it's been over 30 years ago, but I, I had a uh, very strong impression that whatever I was going to talk to with this gentleman, I needed to make sure I knew what in the world I was talking about. Um, and so we started with some serious conversation. And that's because I've told people over the years that if you're having conversations with LDS people, you need to assume that the person you're speaking to has the most knowledge you could expect them to have. And if they don't, then you've, you've, you've honored truth by starting with the important stuff. Um, and in the correspondence, we struck up a correspondence. This was before the internet. This was, uh, this was where you, you... Now, for you young millennials, uh, we use something called the post office uh, to send letters to each other for quite some time. Uh, right, that's right. I think I had a computer by then, so I think it may have been put, print out, print out a dot matrix thing. But um, <clears throat> we began a correspondence at that point in time. At some point, you visited Phoenix, and you attended a study that I gave. Do you remember what the topic of that study was? No idea. It was on <laughs> grieving. Oh, uh-huh. My book on grieving had just come out, and it was titled uh, Christians Grieve Too. And it was at D.L. Culliver's home. I remember that. And uh, that's when I discovered how many an, uh, descendants one of your progenitors had. And it, I about fainted at that point in time. Uh, but you can get into that later on if you want to. Um, but uh, we had a, a very serious interaction for a, a good period of time. And I discovered in Alma, and, and I, I was talking to a, a professor who will remain nameless uh, at a major uh, LDS in institute, uh, institution, and uh, he said, so, so what are you doing while you're up there? And I, I mentioned our dialogue, and he said, so he was an institute teacher, and there really wasn't a whole lot of, <laughs> a lot of respect. I'm not sure what you could get out of that. I said, look, this is the third time we've done this, and, uh, and Alma's one of the best read people I know. So he said, well, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Um, so we've done this a number of times uh, here at the university. We did another dialogue at, uh, at the church out in Magna. Um, and what this allows us to do is, first of all, l- l- let me just ask you a question. Uh, you're not confused about what I believe. Uh, no, I, I don't imagine I'm confused about it. You probably, I mean, you've seen, I've, I've written some books. Yeah, I've, I've read many of your books. Okay, and so, and so uh, this isn't a situation where I'm trying to, surprise you with anything uh, or anything along those lines you know where we're coming from um, and that makes a dialogue like this uh, possible and useful um, because we can focus on other issues without having to go back over the same ground over and over and over again hopefully which we've done for years and years. yeah well yeah we have uh, we have and and i think there's a there's a clear understanding um, there there is no confusion here uh, that i'm sitting here going you know, let's just have an ecumenical type thing where, you know, we don't worry about what truth is and things like that. That's, that's, that's not the issue. Uh, at the same time, uh, we don't have to uh, worry about unnecessary offense. Um, we have already told each other more than once, you're wrong about that, and uh, that's okay. Um, I'm not sure if you've followed much of the work that I've done uh, recently, well, over the past, you know, 15 years or so in Islam, but I got into a tremendous amount of trouble 
for having a dialogue with a Islamic leader. Uh, there are a lot of Christians that don't believe that, for example, you should ever say in public, I learned a great deal from this Muslim leader. I guess you're not supposed to learn about Islam from Muslims. Um, you're only supposed to learn from Christians. Uh, and so I'll get into even more trouble by saying, I was really pushed by you to be careful in my representations of Mormonism. Hopefully you'll say that even when we first met, that there was a concern on my part for being careful to represent uh, Mormonism, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, we have to say now, um, uh, accurately, uh, even at that point in time, because that's always been something that I feel is extremely important um, in, our, in, our, in any type of conversation that, that you have with anyone. Um, but we can talk tonight about what is truth, because Alma knows what I believe about Mormonism, and I know what he believes about, Mor about Mormonism, about my faith, and so on and so forth. We don't have to reestablish all those, those groundworks that you normally would have in, in, in one of these situations. Now, when we talk about what is truth, what I hopefully we can get into, as Jason was saying, is we are living in a secularizing society. And Alma and I, um, I like to say that, you know, when we first met, your hair didn't look like that. No, neither did yours. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I still had some. And uh, I think we were both parents, but now we're grandparents. Very young parents. Very yeah. young parents. And now we're grandparents. We have seen a lot of changes in our society, massive changes. And you'll I'd probably confirm with me that once you have grandchildren, changes everything. Changes everything how you look toward the future and how you see what's going on in our society. How we prepare our grandchildren for the onslaught that we see coming along is an important thing to both of us, but we're going to have to do it differently because there are fundamental differences between us as to how we view truth and how people know truth and what the foundation of truth is. So with that in mind, this is an important discussion. And last evening, I, I think you survived at least through Jeff and I's opening statements. Oh, yeah. And in fact, I, I was well into the follow-ups. Okay, so. okay, good. Uh, so you've already... I missed heard. the antifreeze, though. I apologize. Uh, that you missed a, one of the most classic... That was my... Do you know how many debates as of last night I've done? Last night was my 170th moderated public debate. And it was the craziest one of the 170, I will admit that. Thank you very much, Jason. Jason is extremely proud of the fact that he pulled that off. Um, but uh, the issue really was brought up last night, and you, I'm sure you were hearing what, in what Jeff and I was saying. The triune God as the foundation of our Christian worldview is not a foundation that we share together. We share a theistic foundation. But there is, in the definition of objective truth um, and in our view of man created in the image of God, image of God means something different between the two of us, there are fundamental epistemological differences as to how we can interact with atheists or with secularists who may be atheistic but then again may not. And it goes back to the foundational issues that we started discussing on the sidewalk the first time that we met. That was one of the things I really appreciated is that we, got, we knew what the core issues were. We didn't have to play around with all the side stuff. You knew that, I knew that, and we, we got to it fairly, fairly quickly, but in a, in a respectful fashion. So hopefully in our discussion this evening, and I'm all, already out of time just with all the background, um, but hopefully in our discussion this evening, we can get to... Fundamentally, when we talk about truth in our day, what we believe about God and whether God has eternally been God is absolutely foundational and definitional. And that's where our differences come out. How do we deal with that in dealing with the challenges that we have coming against both of us in a secularizing society? So there's my... There's my I already burned my 10 minutes in talking about how we first met. So, That's okay. So I'll, I'll include some additional things. It's interesting. I, I suspect that uh, when I met you, it was shortly after 
uh, the church published a, uh, a list of the most prominent progenitors in the LDS church, the top 100 men and how many uh, descendants they had. And my great-great-grandfather was number one on the list. In 1977, he had 29,000 descendants in the LDS church. And... Uh, that's a Christmas card list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know, that was, uh, that was 45 years ago. Right. And, uh, That's had to have expanded. Uh, I mean, I had no children, and now I've got uh, 10 grandchildren. So I've only got four. I, I suspect that <laughs> uh, I'm older. <laughs> so, but uh, it, it was interesting. I, I just happened to cross James. I, I worked downtown at the time. Um, my company uh, was the... Um, licensee for, for much of the pay parking in downtown Salt Lake. And particularly during conference, there are people coming and going to all the garages, and I was walking back and forth between our properties and came across James, and I think I sort of fell down in my duties that day because we ended up <laughs> talking did, for quite a while. We did talk well, yeah. Uh, and in fact, as I, as I thought about what we were going to talk about tonight, I went back to that. Um, I made some notes over the past couple of weeks, and I had a great story that I wanted to include, and I thought, this, this is perfect, it comes in here. I was looking at it uh, last night, and I don't, it doesn't fit anywhere, but I still want to tell it. Uh, <laughs> um, it I, in my notes, I said, this reminds me of the account of um, Rene Descartes, who went to some kind of a, a soiree, and someone asked him if he would like a drink, and he said, I think not, and immediately disappeared. I think not. Yeah, yeah. That's, okay, how many got it? How many got it? And all the rest of you, I'm sorry. Uh, you, even. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'll. Yeah. Go I'll ahead speak. and dig it, dig it. Dig it in there. All right. I'll start over. <laughs> I think not. No. Yeah. yeah I think uh, not. Descartes was asked if he wanted a drink. He said, "I think not," and, and he, he disappeared. disappeared. Remember what he? I think. I think. Therefore, therefore I, am. I am. Yeah. No. I think okay. Not. Never mind. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah. That is a good one. So Alma had wanted to be a comedian once, but then he got into parking. Yeah, that's right. And that's not funny. <laughs> so I'm reminded Jason liked that one. Okay. <laughs> but his sense of humor is really yeah. off, so don't worry about it. Okay. But uh, and I have to tell you, um, thinking about truth and our, our perspectives of it, um, you know, if I have come to conclude that there is absolute truth, there's relative truth. Uh, if I were to say the sun is shining, it's not true. At least for us here, the sun apparently went down at 7.05. Um, but the sun is shining in Hawaii. So some things can be relative. They can be true at some times, and other times they, they, they might not be true. Um, there are some absolute truths, and I think absolute truths come to us from God. Uh, what God declares to be true is true. Uh, and there are a couple of absolute truths that I think James and I would absolutely agree on, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and that he died for the sins of the earth or mankind. You say for the saved. But for the elect. For the elect. But mm -hmm. he, he died. Uh, I'd say he di I would say 100% he died for you. And my, my prayer is that, that he died for me as well. Yeah, okay. But the fact is he offered himself as the perfect sacrifice. And that is an absolute truth. I, now, there are others. And, and as I was thinking about how this applies, I was, um, um, I was going to the, the, the main ZCMI Center garage. It had a basement garage. It was one of the few basement garages in Salt Lake City. And the parking gate would not stay up or stay down. It just cycled. And it made it hard for cars to get out. And uh, I went over. I worked on it for a little while. Finally, I gave up. And I just told the cashier, I'm going to break off the gate. If uh, people don't stop, we're just out of luck until I can figure out how to fix this. So I stood up and broke the gate off, set it off to the side, and, and went back into my office. And I thought, you know, I could fix that if I had a workbench that I could just plug those components in. And I looked in, my, uh, in our back office, and there was nothing to plug into. But there was a panel, an electric panel on the wall. And I thought, you know what? 
I'll bet if I could poke a couple of wires in there, I can wire this thing up. The only problem is I knew nothing about electricity. <laughs> and, but I, I set it up, and I, I had the two wires hooked into the panel, and, I, and there was a 112 or 120 uh, outlet on the component. And I had a soldering iron, and I said, if, if I plug this soldering iron in and it works, I did it right. And so I plugged it in, and the lights got dim. And I took it back out. They went back up. I thought, that couldn't have been this. I plugged it in again. All the lights went out. I stepped out into my main office. We were right next door to the main offices for Utah Power and Light. Five-story building. All the lights are out. I step out on the street. As far as you can see in any direction, the lights are out. The semaphores are out. And I hid the soldering iron. <laughs> but for a moment I thought, oh, did I do this? Yeah, did I do this? Was, was this me? And I had to stop worrying about that because we had people stuck in elevators all over town. Um, it, was, it was a nightmare. But about five hours later, they restored the power. They found out that they were burning trash out at the Salt Lake Prison, and the flames went up to the power lines, and it created a domino effect throughout the state of Utah, into Nevada, into Idaho, and Wyoming. And it, was, it made the national news. And when I got home that night, turned on the news, I wanted to see what they said about it. Dan Rather said that there weren't a whole lot of problems in downtown Salt Lake, uh, except for the fact that several hundred people were trapped in the dark in the only underground garage in Salt Lake City because the gates wouldn't open. It was the only garage in Salt Lake that had emergency lighting. And now, how did I know that that wasn't true? Because <laughs> I was there. I experienced it. Um, and I've, I, I, I think I learned at that time that you can't trust a lot of what goes out. Um, you know, they, people talk about fake news and things like that. Um, but even in my school, I, I remember sitting in a biology class. And uh, actually, let me back up. Last week, there was an article uh, in the Smithsonian, uh, National Geographic, a couple others about um, a mutant uh, zebra that they found. Uh, it was polka dot rather than striped. And this is true. This isn't a joke. And uh, they, they made a comment at the end that evolutionists have determined that zebras developed stripes in order to keep from being bitten by a certain type of a fly. And that reminded me of my biology class years ago where the professor said, and this was videotaped because I had to come the next hour and listen to see if I heard it actually, but he said that rattlesnakes developed rattles in order to make it ad advantageous not to be trampled upon by the larger ungulates of the pra prairie. And I leaned over to the student next to me and I said, wasn't it advantageous not to be trampled upon even before they didn't have rattles? Um, but it reminded me that evolutionists teach that evolution is entirely arbitrary and without any pattern. And yet, both of these accounts are trying to teach the world that zebras and rattlesnakes are able to somehow change their DNA to the better once they've noticed that there's a problem. And it's false. I mean, it, it, simple logic tells you that that is not what occurs. Uh, so there are a lot of things. I don't believe the news unless I was there. Um, I'm, I'm always hesitant to make a, a, a decision based on what I see on the news or even in, in classrooms that, where I'm taught. Um, but I also agree with James. I've learned truth in a lot of places outside of my own religious paradigm. I learned truth from James White. I learned some truth when I read the Quran. Um, I learned truth from James. I, um, truth is not the sole domain of my religious perspective. Um, I believe that truth is available to anyone. I believe that it's available to anyone by revelation and not just to Mormons. That James promised that if any lack wisdom, they can ask God and receive wisdom and get it liberally. So um, we, we do have variations, but truth is available. And Joseph Smith said that he's, he doesn't want anybody to give up any truth that they already have. And if they have truth that they can bring with them, 
he's willing to embrace it. And I feel the same way. Is that supposed seven to minutes or? That was 10. That's your 10 minutes. So okay. Let, let's, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you do that so I don't have to sit here with a uh, phone in my hand if that's uh, acceptable to you. Um, let, let's, let's do the big topic first and then we can, we can break it down, down from there. When we talk about revelation, are you talking about something that are you talking about both something that is objective and available to all as well as something separate that is subjective and experiential? Um, and you, you want to probably... Yeah, go, I would, I would go say... Go ahead and swing it. Go ahead and swing okay. it so you're comfortable. Ah, yeah, there okay. you go. That's, that's easy. My wife just told me to make sure I sat up straight. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> um, I would say that my perspective of Revelation is objective. Um, however, I do not believe that revelation comes to man in perfection, that it comes through a filter of mortality. Um, uh, Brigham Young said the same thing. He said he did not believe that any revelation that came to, to, to man from God was perfect um, in itself, that God speaks to us according to our limitations and our um, faulty understanding. And so perhaps you might see that as subjective, that um, if, you, if you go to the Book of Mormon, you have um, the brother of Jared is told to, to build some barges, and he doesn't know how to get light. He goes to God and says, we can't steer it. There's no light. I don't know what to do. God says, well, you don't know where you're going, so you don't need to steer um, light. You figure it out and get back to me. And so the brother of Jared works on something, comes back. Now, I suspect, from my perspective, from my paradigm, is that he was led by God in a certain way, but also in keeping with his perspectives. So what he developed was um, a cooperative effort between his own intellect and God's revelation. So when we talk about an objective revelation, is there something that we can pass on, since we were talking about how old we both are, is, that, is there something we can pass on to our grandchildren that remains objectively true for generation after generation? Yes. But in light of what you just said, is it an imperfect revelation? Well, we don't believe in perfection. We don't believe that the Bible is perfect. We don't believe that the Book of Mormon is perfect. Uh, we don't believe in infallible uh, doctrine. So does our knowledge increase? Is there a limitation as to what, how much we can actually then know? I suspect, yes, in mortality, yeah. That we are limited by our, uh, our physical beings. That, uh, uh, but I don't know what that limit is. So the central aspects of Joseph Smith's revelation, such as what is contained in the King Follett Funeral Discourse, is that something that can change, or is that an objectively real truth well, that, 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 has the, that has the same meaning from generation to generation? Um. I'm, I'm a little reluctant to, to go to the King Follett Discourse simply because it's a, it's a compilation of uh, accounts by, I think it was four different people. Um, it's never been canonized. And yet it's the most quoted of Joseph Smith's teachings by the general authorities over, I did a study once, and uh -huh. it was the most quoted words of Joseph Smith by general authorities for 100 and, 130 hmm. years. Well, I'd be interested to see that because... Uh, uh, I mean, I'm familiar with it. I've read it quite a few times, but uh, I would suspect, well, and it's in Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, so that's, uh, um, I, would, I would suspect um, my own experience, uh, as I mentioned, I've, I've taught Institute of Religion for 30 years, and I would be surprised if I've quoted it 10 times in the last 30 years in my classes. And, and uh, more than half of that time, I taught church history. 
So I'm not sure that the, but I would say uh, the revelations that are canonized, I think they, they contain objective truth. I don't think that, that I, don't, I don't believe that, that that's changeable. Um, that are canonized. So, yeah. well, this is, a, this, I think this is important. Um, in, in my experience today, I am seeing questions, more and more questioning on the part of Mormons. I'm sorry to use the term. That's okay. We, I mean, it's we, just, I, it's just, yeah, we, it's, we, we, can we do all know who we're talking about, yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm seeing more and more hesitation um, in affirming things that when you and I first met, wouldn't have even been a, a question in regards to exaltation and nature of God and, and, and things along those lines. The interpretation of section 132, it seems to me like the King Fala discourse just is a very clear summary of those things. And yet I'm finding more and more Mormons who are uncertain about these things. Has there been a diminishment in our, in our lifetimes of the, of the clarity of what the central issues are? Has there been a shift or a diminishment, in your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, I think there has been a, a, a reduction of the focus because of the tremendous great growth of the church. When you have, uh, I don't know how many, 100,000 join the church every, every year, um, I think initially people expected those new converts to delve right in and become uh, experts on the teachings of Joseph Smith, the teachings of exaltation. We still, I mean, I teach exaltation. I teach it regularly. Uh, I don't think there's a diminishment of, of what the doctrine is. I mean, uh, section 132 is, is pretty specific. Mm -hmm. um, and 130, the, the embodied the enfleshment. Yeah, no, no question about that. And I don't see anyone... Um, of the church leaders who are questioning it and saying, oh, gee, you know, did... did was but Joseph is there a diminishment on their part in a discussion of it, in a presentation of it, in conference talks? And, 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 and the... the, the um, remember the marriage manual from 1992, Achieving mm -hmm. a Celestial Marriage? It was very clear. I had quoted from it for years. But the current one is not nearly as clear as the one from 1992. Well, and I think that goes back to the fact that you have thousands and thousands of young people who are new members of the church, who are planning on going to the temple, getting married in the temple. Uh, now, a good friend of mine wrote that, that manual. The one in 1992? Yeah. The white one? Uh, uh -huh. And uh, have you, have you don't told, tell anybody. Have you told him that I've been quoting annoyed. that for years in my presentations? <laughs> <laughs> no. But he, he doesn't like the fact that it was, it was replaced. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, another good friend of mine is, uh, wrote the replacement manual. <laughs> so, you but know, you don't have on... dinner with both of them at the same time. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Um, but um, I don't see a problem with... Uh, well, I, I do see... I, I don't like some of the way that some of it was presented. Which, which uh, some? The, the, the earlier one. Uh, I'm, I'm more comfortable with, with the presentation of the later ones because... Um, I think some of the quotes that you were quoting, mm -hmm. I, I think I, I watched the YouTube, mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, yeah, I'm glad that's no longer there. Really? Uh, yeah. But I, 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 you know, I'm drawing a blank so, so on the, what it was. Well, well, it was the conversation between an older, more experienced uh, Mormon and a younger Mormon, and he's asking questions like, why is the, is the eternal marriage ceremony so important? And it was about the necessity of having, uh, you know, you know yeah, I, now, I, now I remember. And okay. I remember one of the things that made me uncomfortable about it is it's... Uh, it was it's corny. A, it's, a contri it's a contrived It was very uh, corny. Discussion. It was very corny. You know, There's no and, question about that. Uh, uh, I mean, I even said in my presentations, this was obviously a frustrated English major uh, uh, at BYU that was, was writing this. Because, actually, he wasn't at BYU. But okay, <laughs> but, 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 the idea, but the idea was uh, it was almost to be or not to be a type of language. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was yeah, a lot it was, on the corny it, side. Yeah, I thought it was corny, and I, I'm, I'm glad it's no longer there. Yeah. Uh, but... But what it said the, the, was the premise, clear. Yeah, the premise is, is clear. I mean, we, we believe that, that God's promises to us are that if we are faithful, 
that we will have the same blessings that his son Jesus Christ has. Or that he himself as God. He, yeah. Well, and, and everything that the father is, uh, I, I would say the son is as well. I'd like to probe that a little bit in light of the planet and and offspring and, and, and issues like that. But the the for me right right now as I'm as I'm dialoguing with with many Mormons, there is simply much more clarity, and in, and in fact a willingness to just directly state. I mean, I think I told you about El, Elder Hollywood. Uh, I, I, I encountered, his name wasn't Hollywood, uh, but he actually had a badge that said Elder Hollywood. This was okay. one of the most interesting missionaries. Oh, this missionaries. was a missionary. This one of okay. the most interesting missionaries I've ever run into. Uh -huh. But he and I got into a conversation on a street in Mesa during the Easter pageant. And he got quite animated. And, it's, and he was much taller than me. And so at one point, he's towering over me. And he's, he's getting louder and louder. And this is a direct quote. Eventually, he got to the point where he said, Someday... I'm going to be a God and you are going to worship me. And he's saying it that loudly. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden he stops because there's a whole group of people around yeah. us watching this. And they're all just like looking at him like this. And he, he sort of, uh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. But he was, I mean, it, was, it wasn't like there are some people who think this might happen or yeah. something like that. He was straight yeah. forward. Well, I can't be held responsible for the I'm ignorance, not asking you, ignorance I'm not of asking missionaries. You. The, 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 the <laughs> point is that, that and, and I know the, the folks here from Apologia Church went out a lot to the Christmas light stuff in Mesa and things like that. And we've just simply noticed over the decades a diminishing, not only a diminishing willingness to talk, but a diminishing knowledge of the King Follett discourse and the related issues to that to the point where we are now encountering Mormons who will say, uh, you know, Joseph Smith had some false prophecies and, you know, you've got your truth and we've got our truth and no one's really certain about this exaltation stuff, exactly what that means and things like that. And we're all going, have you read these books? And when I went to Deseret Book across the street from the temple just a couple days ago, I walked in and you and I have had a bit of this conversation before, but I walked in and the doctrine section, the section of specific doctrinal books, is minuscule in comparison to what that was once before. And it's in alphabetical order. So I looked up my old favorite from the 1980s because I handed a tract to him once as he was walking in the conference, Bruce R. McConkie. There were a grand total of five individual books, three copies of one book, two copies of another book, stashed over in the corner. And part of me really felt sorry for old Bruce, really did, uh, because he's almost not even known to many of the people we talk to anymore. Well, uh, and I think historically, you, the, the church has noticed that there has been um, a declining capacity of the young members of the church to understand doctrine. Um, is it a c declining capacity or is it a diminishment of emphasis from the leadership? I think it's a, de it's a declining capacity. Um, I, you know, there are different students uh, today than I had 25 years ago. Uh, and, and I think that cell phones, uh, instant gratification mm. of the internet, mm. things like that have, have reduced the need for people to study to perceive, uh, to, to ponder. Um, uh, and in fact, I think it was about three years ago, the church uh, uh, retooled uh, the, the subject matter for institute. And they have, I, I don't remember whether it's four or five subjects that they're called uh, cornerstone courses. They, they hit very heavily doctrine. I mean, not, I, I used to teach church history New Testament. Basically, that's what I taught. Uh, in the last four years, I have taught eternal marriage. Uh, actually, not eternal marriage, the eternal family. And it is heavily, uh, uh, it, there's a lot of heavy doctrine in it. Uh, I have had students walk out of the class saying, boy, I never imagined that, that, that this was here. But I think it's because they haven't, they haven't studied themselves. Uh, I'm teaching Foundations of the Restoration right now. 
it talks about all kinds of, uh, you know what, and I can't remember if it, if it cites the King Paulette discourse. Um, but but they're it, not getting this in any place else? Uh, do they not listen to conference talks? Do they not? Is there no discussion of this in the ward uh, chapel? What, what? I think I think there's a. There's the ten-year-old kids used to come up to us on mm-hmm. the streets, and they knew about plurality of gods and exaltation, and they knew we didn't believe that. Uh-huh. That's not the case anymore. Well, 10-year-olds, it depends on the 10-year-old. Uh, well, know. okay, okay. I, I'm sure you could find a precocious uh, yeah. 10-year-old. Well, no, I mean, uh, I, I would say uh, I'm very comfortable with the doctrinal capacity of my own grandchildren. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Me too. Yeah, and, uh, and I think it, 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 it's in large part due to the teaching that they get in their home. But uh, not so much from the church anymore? From the church, yeah. Uh, and the church has tried to, to, to promote the focus of the cottage industry. The, peop- the children learn the teachings of the gospel in the home at the feet of their parents. Uh, well, I mean, we certainly believe that, that. Well, that's where I learned it. I mean, yeah. um, uh, I remember I failed a class of seminary one year. Um, and the teacher said, I, uh, you know, I want you to come talk to me about it. Um, and I said, he said, Basically, it was because we got a final exam. The exam was, what did you think of the, the class this year? And I thought, well, I thought it was a waste of time. <laughs> and he gave me an F. And back then, uh, uh, seminary in the high school was part of your high school credit. You know, my uh, GPA took a nosedive <laughs> with that yeah, F in seminary. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, as we talked about it, I said, you know, we don't, we don't, hand, we don't discuss any heavy doctrine. There's, there we're not getting what I think is, is remarkable and, and memorable. And he said, you know, uh, I can't compete with the dinner table at your home. He said, I have all kinds of students that are in, in varying degrees of comprehension. And he said, I have to tailor it to um, the lowest common denominator. And so for me, that was, that was kind of boring. Yeah. And well, I had the same experience in my Southern Baptist church. I mean, the, the Sunday school material was like, could we really talk about something meaningful? Yeah. I, so I, I get that part of it, but it does, it does seem to me um, that our society is, as you, you mentioned, the screen time, the, the electronic inst- the lack of long-term attention, the ability to focus upon abstract concepts, we're all facing that in our in, in, wherever it might be. You know, there was an article in the last month that one of the college football coaches says that he can't hold meetings for longer than 50 minutes because his football players can't leave their phones along for long uh, that right. long. And they've right. got to take a break and check their email or, or do some surfing or something like or that. Or they get they get stressed out. Yeah, yeah, that's and a nice question about. They need a safe room. And and yeah, and about three years ago. I don't know if you noticed, but I, I did a, uh, I was asked to be on the Dr. Drew show on CNN. I was on twice, once by Skype, which is a major mistake. And then when they asked me back on, I said, I'll fly over. They said, we can't fly in it. That's okay. My wife works on an airline. I'll fly over. Um, and I was in studio on the subject of transgenderism. But one of the things we were told in the green room before we went out is that their studies had shown that you should not make a statement that you expect to be remembered by their audience that lasts more than 15 seconds. 15 seconds, you need to change speakers to keep the attention of the average CNN viewer. That is an amazing reality. It is. That is impacting all of us, wherever we are. There's no question about it, because... There are certain truths that cannot even be enunciated in 15 seconds. Uh, and if you have to keep breaking it up amongst different people, you can never get into anything that has any, any meaningful depth. So, but let, let, me, let me put it this way. We see, uh, when I say we, if I speak broadly of evangelicals, and I would represent a, a very strongly reformed uh, 
section of, of, of evangelicalism. Not those others that need to be reformed. They need to be. <laughs> hey, that's why we do debates on that subject. We're just, we're just letting the Lord bring them along. Um, but uh, we emphasize, uh, it was mentioned before, um, one of the pastors at Apologia Church is Jeff hiding. There's, there's Jeff Durbin back there, and Luke's over there, and there's that. We've got all the, all, the, all four pastors are sitting right there. Um, and we emphasize... We, we do catechism questions as, as part of our as part of our worship. Uh, many of our uh, of our students, uh, many of our, our families are homeschoolers. Um, my daughter's homeschooling my grandchildren. Um, we really uh, emphasize connectedness with historical, you know, the history of our of our faith and the people that came before us and all those types of things, uh, because we see what's going on in our society and this diminishment of an ability to be focused. But we also believe that there is a div- body of divine truth that, as Jude says, the, the once for all delivered to the saints faith that's going to remain true no matter what's going on in society around us. Now, we, we believe Christ is going to be victorious and that he is going to establish his kingdom and that any society that decides to commit suicide by not being able to figure out who boys and girls are uh, is going to fall. But that doesn't mean Christ's kingdom is going to fall along with it. So we are very committed to that, that, that belief. But where I see a difference, and this is, this is I think, what Jason wants us to do to be able to, to, to cast some light on this. And I think this is good because here, here you and I are, we ha- now we have a few decades under the belt. The fervor of youth isn't quite as strong as it once was, uh, and we are recognizing you and I both have probably have had friends of our age that have already left this earth. And every little twinge, we're wondering, is it my turn? <laughs> that, that's what happens to, to once, once you get, once you get in, 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 into this, this time of our life. And it does give perspective. I don't care what anybody says. It gives perfect perspective. I think you'd agree in, in, our, in, in the New Testament. There's something good about having some experience to be an elder. That's one of the differences we would have as to the use of the term elder, I think, uh, along those lines. But there is... In that office of elder, there was the idea of experience. Don't lay hands on someone who's a neophyte, who's someone who's, who's too young. We have the, these experiences. And for me, the, one of the key issues is that the truth that I can communicate to my grandchildren, my, my oldest is nine, okay? And my youngest is three, and just uh, last week, my daughter texted me, and my, my youngest has been slow at developing proper speech patterns. She had a cleft palate, and so the, there's just been an issue along in the development there. But she's doing really well, and she was just talking. She had just said, the father, the son, and the, and the Hoey Spirit. And she had managed to get the Hoey Spirit out this time. Um, and the, the point is that there is a body of truth that defines the faith that we believe will always be there, that this is the once for all delivered to the saints' faith. Now, so you and I, A, we have an issue on the subject of apostasy. That would be an issue that would be worthwhile to delve into. But we also have a fundamental issue in the definition of what that, what is it that is going to be lasting and cannot be changed no matter what society does whether let's say let's say and and you all have experienced you've had you have you've had missions overseas that have experienced persecution we have issues in regards to communism in north in china in north in north korea uh, certain places in africa dealing with islam persecution that takes place in those places what is the body of truth that remains firm and unchangeable no matter what happens technologically, historically in this world, what's going to last? And my, let me put this out here and get your reaction to it. 
And by the way, I don't know about you, but I'm thankful we still have the freedoms in this country to sit what in time a room. Is it? To sit, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> to sit in a room like this and have this kind of conversation, we can't take it for granted. Yeah. You and I, when we first spoke, could never have imagined the restrictions that we're now seeing, even in the university setting, for having a conversation like this. Go ahead. Back up now. You, you, I'm not going to, I will, I will not forget. You were supposed to make a comment that we do not represent the university and that we're not getting paid as much as we were promised, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, no one is speaking for the university. That's right. No one is speaking for the university. And that included last night. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, Go ahead. It, 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 is, it is interesting. It's, it's appalling, the loss of our freedoms. Um, how language has been... Oh, goodness. Uh, yes. Uh, is, it, is it inappropriate to say bastardized? No, it's not. That's okay. a perfectly good English okay. term. <laughs> um, uh, several years ago, we had uh, a university president whose theme that he put posters all over the campus that said, zero tolerance for intolerance. Now Think that one through for a second. <clears throat> but what that meant was, if you do not agree with the LGBTQ agenda, we do not have tolerance for you. Um, uh, it's interesting. Each year, we would have the university president speak at the Institute of Religion. And um, the first time we had a non-Mormon... <laughs> a non-member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> <laughs> President of the university. You know, that Alicia. change has made you people irrelevant on Twitter. <laughs> That's true. Because you, you just Nobody can type that you, much. You can't yeah. have that. You don't have enough yeah. space. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the first non-LDS president was uh, 1912, 1913. His, uh, his name was Joseph Kingsbury. Uh, later on, there was a... Uh, a Jeopardy question that said, who was the first non-Mormon president? And they said uh, it was Arthur Smith, but he was 70 years after the first non-Mormon president. But um, when, when Arthur Smith came, we discussed as a faculty, should we have a non-member of the church come in and address the faculty? And we thought it would be a great idea. You mean the Institute? The Institute, sorry. Okay. Uh, I, I was just I trying to follow. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he came, gave a wonderful uh, speech. It was uplifting. Everybody thought, yeah, this is great. Um, a few years later, another president came over and chastised us for our outdated perspectives concerning marriage and sexuality and said that it was high time we apologize to the world for that and also apologize for polygamy. <laughs> you know, uh, Why? Uh, well, because, well, let me, let me give you a, a little more perspective. When he came, it wasn't, it wasn't, visible to most of the people on the campus that he had some real problems with Mormon theology, uh, unless you, you heard him speak and he used the cant that is, uh, that is common w with some uh, critics of Mormonism. But one of his big ones was, was uh, uh, well, I'll give you a, an account. My boss had told me, don't get caught alone with him because he likes to fire people, <laughs> you know? And uh, I was at uh, an evening uh, concert, outdoor concert, and it was on the grass, you know, after a while, you gotta stand up and stretch your legs, and I noticed I'm standing next to him. And he said, I, I thought, I gotta get out of here, I started to take off, and he said, wait a minute, he said, I'm supposed to know you. I said, Alma Allred, and he says, oh, that's right, the infamous director of parking. <laughs> and he said- uh, Infamous? Yeah, well, that's... everybody hates the parking guy. It's <laughs> oh, that's... Uh, and he said, I've been meaning to ask you, are you related to the infamous Allreds that I've been reading about in the paper? And there, you know, every once in a while, the, the fundamentalists, who are, a lot of them are Allreds, uh, rise to the front of the, the, the media. And, Most famous is Rulin, right? Yeah, my, my, my uncle Rulin, he was my dad's oldest brother. He was murdered in 1977 by one of the, at the behest of the LeBarons. It's kind of a sort of an exciting Infighting story. type thing, right? Well, he, he, uh, the LeBarons had something against everybody else. Everybody else sort of got along peacefully, but okay. he was out to kill people. And he killed, I think, several dozen people. 
Uh, if you want to get scared, read about Ervil the Baron. Uh, but, um, so he said, are you related to those infamous Mormons I read about? Or the infamous All Reds? And I said, well, yeah, but you know, you can't pick your relatives. <laughs> you, know, the, 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 you get what you get, what you, what you get. And he said, I guess not. He said, is your wife here tonight? And I made one of the biggest mistakes of my career. I said, yeah, my first wife is right over there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I turned, turned back and he said, he, he, was, he was really angry, I could see it in his face, and I said, that's a family joke. And he said, it had better be. <laughs> and, he, and he walked away, but I realized that um, from his perspective, I, you know, I, I love our current university president, I don't think she's anything like that, but from his perspective, um, what is it when you try to include every Inclusion is not inclusion, what's the term? Uh, in inclusivity. Well, I inclusivity had a caveat. Oh, of course. That it was, uh, it was as long as you agreed with our precepts. That's, um, that's, uh, that's our modern and, culture. And I have to, I'll, I'll explain, my wife is my first wife. It's perfectly appropriate. She is my first wife. Um, in fact, one day she came to me after she found out that uh, I was related to a lot of polygamists, and she said, I've been thinking about this, and if you want another wife, you can have another wife. You'll still only have one, but you can have another one. <laughs> so that's our program. Yeah. So you guys yeah. are just a matched pair. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. But uh, now I, that was a, a big veer. I apologize for that. But the language has changed. You have to be very, very careful about what you say in public. And, um, uh, and people get their feelings hurt. And that is now the greatest sin is offense, yeah. is offending someone. And it, it is interesting to me that the first missionaries I met in 1982, back then, the first thing they talked about was Joseph Smith's first vision and his statement that all the churches were wrong and abomination, corrupt, and all the rest of that stuff, and they handed out the Joseph Smith testimony tract. Uh -huh. And so they, there was not a hesitancy to say there is one true church and, and we's it. Uh -huh. um, you but, think there is now? I'm sorry? You think there is now? Yes. Hmm. Oh, I have had a re I've, that's been my experience. In fact, I sat in a ward chapel two years ago in front of the pulpit with uh, two people that were interested and two missionaries. And Alma, no matter how hard I tried, and I, I, I can quote a lot of LDS leaders. I could not get them to affirm that there was one true church. I could not get them to affirm that their priesthood authority was necessary for proper ordinances before God. I could not get them to do that's it. That's unfortunate. Um, uh, I mean, come to my ward and you'll... <laughs> well, that, that's just it. And I'll that's affirm just, that right here. That, that's just it. But, I mean, they were trained at the same missionary training center in Provo that everybody else was. And I, I noticed something, actually today, uh, uh, Jason brought up once or twice that the only church that is, that is condemned <laughs> in all of Mormon scripture is Presbyterianism. But uh, I noticed that there's a similar condemnation of all Cretans uh, by the Apostle Paul. This that is, they are this is true. always liars. <laughs> They're always, that's what he <laughs> you know, said. That's what he uh, said. That's worse than, uh, but okay. Back to... Well, Baptists weren't mentioned in there. I thought Baptists were mentioned in the first vision, weren't they? No. In, in, passing. in passing. Oh, please. Yeah. Come on. The only, the oh, only... Okay. <laughs> I've learned for myself that Presbyterianism is untrue. Okay. I, I, I get it. Uh, and, and, and in fact, we visited the Joseph Smith house in, uh, in Palmyra, uh, and we got pictures of Jeff and I uh, leaning up against the, uh, the uh, fireplace. Uh, and we, we've thought about sending it to you. With I've learned for myself that Presbyterian is untrue, but I, we decided not to do that. Trouble so, is, that's uh, the wrong fireplace. Well, I know, but uh, it's close enough. That's, okay. a, that's the best you can best you can approximate. Yeah. Anyways, so back to the point, uh, which we have wandered away from, and and that's what I want to try to get to, especially this evening. Is okay. Here we are. We're thankful for the opportunity to, to to have the freedom to have this type of conversation and to do so without animus and things like that. But there are still very clearly the statements that, that the LDS Church makes. You can't even say that anymore, can you? 
Yeah, you, you can say it. Uh, you can say LDS yeah. church. It's, it's well, okay. The prophet's not going to get angry with you yeah. about it. Okay. Well, <laughs> you, you may so. have to say something longer, but <laughs> I can say it in shorthand. So uh, that the LDS church makes in regards to priesthood authority, those are still valid claims, right? Absolutely. In fact, my institute class this week, um, uh, I, I gave a quote by Bru- uh, Boyd K. Packer that we cannot um, surrender the claim that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the only true and living church on the face of the earth. And by that, what is meant not is that, that we have the only truth, but that we have the only authorized priesthood. Outside of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we believe there is no other authorized priesthood. And that priesthood is required. It is essential for the immortality and eternal life of man. So... When I talk to Mormons who are willing to, especially after the, what was it, was was about two years ago, was the Ensign article that basically, from my perspective, threw Brigham Young under the bus about race. Oh, okay. Okay. Many people today would trace their priesthood authority back through the days of Brigham Young and even through Brigham Young. Sure, I do. So there is a, so if you... The, the, the ease with which, for example, not only, you know, I used McConkie as an example, but he was an apostle of the church. And yet I can't tell you how many Mormons I've talked to that are just with disdain willing to dismiss him as... Yeah, that's unfortunate. Um, as an old fogey that had old fogey ideas. Uh-huh. When the next generation starts taking positions amongst the general authorities... What is the core that cannot be compromised? Does Let me put it this way. In light of what you said earlier about revelation always being mediated in a, was an, did you turn, use the term imperfect or flawed yeah. fashion? Okay. Is there a core that cannot be compromised no matter who the general authorities are? Or is there not in the very essence of Mormon theology because of the concept of continuing revelation, the possibility of a fundamental redefinition for our great-grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, of what is definitional of Mormonism, of the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, so that our, my great-grandchildren, your great-grandchildren would see a Mormon church that is that linguistically is fundamentally different than what you and I have debated over for 30 years. Yeah, I, I would say uh, they won't see something that's different. Now, there are, uh, there are changes that occur in practice, uh, but we have a canon of Scripture. Uh, that is interpreted scripture, by the hierarchy. Yeah, well, but there, it's, it's hard to interpret... Um, well, and my opening statement, I was going to, I was going to point out that a lot of things can be interpreted. You and I both claim to believe the Bible, and we see it very differently. But uh, when the the doctrine and covenant says that this is the only true and living church, that's 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 our canon. Um, you're not going to see uh, a redefinition of that. They say, well, you know. Um, You can see that in in what was at one point the the reorganized church. Uh, Exactly. um, Where are they today? um, I think about 11 years ago, the presiding bishop gave a a financial account. For the past several years, they've been selling property in order to meet living expenses. And he did say that at a certain point in the near future, they were going to run out of property, but they were also going to run out of members at the same time. So it... Right, right. And did they not embrace a form of what we would call Protestant liberalism? Oh, absolutely. They're, and they're, it, they're opposed to Israel. They're, and, they, they and they, promote, uh, they're, they're following the exact same track of all the Protestant liberals in yeah, the process. Well, and they also have uh, a, a triune uh, deity. I mean, they are, they are as close to the Nicene Creed as I think as you would be. Except they have, what, what did they do with the Book of Mormon? Um, it's, um, 
what was the, the term in Pirates of the Caribbean? Yeah. Uh, you know, when they... Part of the guideline. <laughs> it's a guideline. <laughs> so, so it became spiritualized. Oh, very much so. A, it, it, so it became a, it, it was no longer considered to have a historical reality to it, and it became spiritualized. Well, not only that, I mean, if, if you go to their temple and uh, take a tour of the, the area, they will, they will explain to you that in the spring of 1820, Joseph Smith went into the woods and had a remarkable experience and changed, that changed him. No content to it. No content at all. Right. Right. Uh, and but, the Book of Mormon peoples are what? The, the, were there really Lamanites and Nephites? Well, I think you can believe it if you'd like, but you're not expected to if you don't. So the primary thing is the spiritual truths that can be derived from the stories. If that. Uh, I mean, I... This is... The, okay, this is, this is where I wanted to go. Sorry to put that on That's top okay. of your book. That's all right. Have you seen this? Uh, tilt it back a little bit. The New Testament. Is that by... Go ahead. Uh, I, don't you love this? We're both sitting here with our, our, our um, yeah. reading. I, did, our, our, I didn't, our I didn't wear my bifocals. Uh, see, these well, bifocals, mine, at least I have progressive lenses. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> though I hate that term anymore because it's been hijacked as well. So um, this is a New Testament translation for Mormons uh-huh. by a Mormon scholar. Who's published it? Um, well, this I is, can't read the fine print. Sorry. Is it sign- is, what, what's the, what's the, on the, on if, the if it's fine signature. There? What's on the spine there? This was, there were multiple... I can fix this. There were multiple copies uh-huh. in, in Deseret, Deseret Book. book. Hmm. Uh, both paperback and the hardback. F. I got recommended to read, to, to check out a new New Testament commentary, but... Uh, Voila. You know, that's French. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's by Deseret Book? Yeah, I I have not seen it. It's been recommended okay. to me. Let me. I, I especially wanted to get your take on this because I think this connects exactly what we were just talking about. So we're okay. we're going the right direction here. When I saw this, the first the first thought across my mind was that could never have happened in 1985. Uh huh. I mean that just because of the fact that if you that by doing this, first thing I wanted to find out when I when I started looking at it is what was the textual basis. What, te- what was the Greek text that this, this scholar is translating? Mm-hmm. It's the Nestle in 28th edition, which is that, that, that text right there, which is what all modern English translations utilize. It's not the Textus Receptus that was used for the King James. And hence, there are Book of Mormon references that would go back to the King James that are going to be different here. Sure. When I looked at it, it's an incredibly good translation from what I've seen. I haven't analyzed all of it. But even texts like John 1.18, where the, the King James has only begotten Son, this says only begotten God, the difference between monogenes theos and monogenes theos. And it follows the, the modern translations, the ESV, NASB, um, and the difference is it has notes that have cross-references to the Book of Mormon or something like that. But even when the Joseph Smith translation has major changes, like in John 6, 44, Romans chapter 4, who does not justify the ungodly, there's a note, but the translation follows the Greek text, the Nessian Greek text. So when I look at something like this, and it's on the shelves at Deseret Book in both hardback and paperback versions, I'm sitting here going, all right, where inevitably does this go? We have, uh, sometime back in the 70s, I would guess, there was a decision made by, I don't know who, I would assume the hierarchy of the church, to send graduates from Brigham Young outside of Utah to get graduate degrees to raise the status of Mormon scholarship in the world. And they started doing this. And you started seeing more and more Mormons getting PhDs in Europe or back east at Ivy League schools and then coming back to, and, and teaching. I think this has had a huge unintended 
impact upon the direction of the general authorities of the church. When I see something like this, I go, wow. Because if you take, if someone like this, Thomas Waymond, if he takes the training he has received in critical theory, not critical race theory and things like that, but in, in critical New Testament theory and things like textual that. Textual criticism. Textual criticism. And you apply it to the book of Abraham. The only way to forward at that point is to spiritualize and remove any historical claims to the historicity of the book of Abraham. And that inevitably moves forward in the same way that it did very quickly for the RLDS church, but over time to the Book of Mormon. And it just, and, and okay, I, I could see, because would, would you agree with me that the primary doctrinal content is found in the Doctrine and Covenants and not so much in the Book of Mormon as to the definitional issues of exaltation and things like that? Wouldn't that be something that's primarily found in the pages of the Doctrine and Covenants. Yeah, I, I would think so. Okay. I, I don't think the purpose of the Book of Mormon was necessarily to teach doctrine. So the spiritualization, historically speaking, of the Nephites, Lamanites, whatever else, wouldn't ne of necessity result in a fundamental change in central theological... Oh, I think it would. I, I think it would. Why? Why? Um, I think th there are there are Mormons today that I, I disagree with who want to spiritualize the Book of Mormon, think that you know it 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 isn't an actual historical record. Right. And um, there's a big problem with that because you go to the foundation of the witnesses. You've got the three witnesses and the eight witnesses, and who testified and claimed throughout their lives. I saw an actual book. I handled an actual book. And I have asked Mormons of that ilk, and I say, how do you explain that? And they say, well... Weren't those, I'm, I couldn't worked they be spiritual it. visions as well? From their perspective? Wouldn't uh, there be, couldn't there be a, a consistent way of doing this? No, nah, not, not that something that you've handled. You can't spiritualize something that you've handled and hefted. Uh, great, ver uh, great verb. I'm not sure I, I know of a better verb in English for, hefted, to yeah. heft something. But... Um, I think uh, there was a bifurcation at the death of Joseph Smith uh, with uh, the people that followed reorganized uh, uh, restorationism and those who followed Brigham Young. And it was an attempt to jettison most of the doctrines that were taught in the Nauvoo period. Right. And, uh, you know... I've, I've talked to reorganites who have, who have proclaimed loudly or, or proudly that, yes, Mormonism is Joseph Smith's church and the reorganized church is Emma's. Mm. That's and, interesting. Um, so I, I see a spiritualization there. I mean, uh, pretty much everything that Joseph Smith taught uh, in the Nauvoo period was jettisoned right. from reorganized. I mean, they, they took out the sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. Right. Um, there's, no, there's no Book of Abraham. There's no Pearl Great Price, that yeah. type of thing, too. Yeah. So, so you see a difference there. Okay. Oh, and but, the, the other thing is, I don't think that this, this movement for, for scholars to get an education outside of, of uh, the Wasatch Front right. is, uh, as you see it, uh, Richard Lloyd Anderson got his, his Ph.D., I think, in the early 60s. Uh, at Berkeley, and then went on to Yale. Um, uh, Anyone who gets yeah. a degree at Berkeley is questionable. <laughs> <laughs> That's not there. <either. laughs> but I, but I do see a, that there has been an emphasis on doing that, and that's bringing in a perspective that was foreign. Uh, I was going to ask you this question: Would you agree that there was a period of stability? in what defined Mormon orthodoxy from about the time 
of the, what was it, 1911, 1912 First Presidency Statement that, that identified Jehovah and Elohim? Uh, the, the exposition on the Father and the Son. Right, that was 11, 12, uh, somewhere? 1918. Okay, okay, it was in, in that decade. From that period and through McConkie, there was, a, there was a lot of consistency. Joseph Fielding Smith, uh, I mean, you, you, you don't see much change at that particular point in time. Because, I mean, some people would argue, and I, I think they're right, that the identification of Elohim and Jehovah, that wasn't Joseph Smith's position, position but it became the doctrine. It's stable for a long period of time. And now we've entered into a period of time where things that were givens before are becoming questioned, or at least de-emphasized in a section. But there was a period of time where, from generation to generation, you pretty much had the same core being being passed on. From from that point in time through what the seventies, maybe? Would you agree? Well, I I, I don't see the uh, the same modification that I think you do. As far as, as as far as modern day Mormons, yeah. So you um, wouldn't see that there's been any kind of shift in emphasis in theology, the teaching from in the general uh, conference. I, I think I think you will. Th- there has been a, a shift that I think started with David O. McKay. Okay. Um, uh, uh, less of a tendency to be in your face. Right. Um, um, Hinckley especially, I think, because he had been involved in the church publicity department. And yeah. I really saw a change after that. Yeah. Well, and I think the, the church learned that you have more dialogue uh, when, you, uh, when you don't try to slap people off the side of the head to start out with the, your discussion. Um, Saying that your church is wrong and ours is right. Uh, yeah. In fact, I, I think uh, the Doctrine and Covenant says... Uh, not to not to rail against any specific church. I have to. T- it also says to do debates, however. Yeah. And that yeah, which doesn't happen very much anymore. We've tried. That guy over there tries all the time. Yeah. Uh, but you know, uh, hasn't hasn't worked real well recently. Well, and, and I think I think the church leaders agree with me that we don't believe that uh, that de- debate establishes truth. It gets people thinking. I think. Um, but I think we've found better ways to spread the gospel. So the, the early Mormons who were doing that regularly, it was just a different context? Yeah, it, I, I think the, they had, um, that was probably the best way to get notoriety, to get people to listen to them. Given that they were very small at that point in time. Yeah. Back to this before, I, before we get too, wander too far away from it. I see this as a major, major transitionary point where you can have Mormon scholars who who feel the freedom to produce a translation that Deseret Book makes available that is based upon a critical text that Mormons did not produce and which is fundamentally different than the text that was used in the King James Version of the Bible and that fundamentally says... The Joseph Smith translation has no meaning. I think you've gone uh, beyond there. Uh, I but, mean, I, but I mean, I mean, from a critical perspective, the changes that Joseph Smith made are not reflected in any way, shape, or form in the Nestle Holland 28th edition of the Greek New Testament that's the basis for this. Mm-hmm. It's one thing if a translation was produced for Latter-day Saints that included that, it's not there. It's not even the, 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 the so, so here's, here, so my, cons- my, my thinking is this. What in Mormonism can stop, other than, uh, sound like what you were saying was, well, there was a bifurcation, Emma's church, Brigham Young's church, so on and so forth. But is there anything epistemologically in your understanding of truth that can stop Mormonism from going the direction, maybe not as quickly, mm-hmm. but going the direction that the RLDS church has gone. Because what can stop people teaching at BYU saying, whether you believe that 
Nephi existed or not is up to you. The important thing is that you get the the moral of the story. Yeah. Because if he would you agree with me that if he didn't exist, the moral of the story could be gotten from any place else. Sure, sure, no question about that. But um, I think you have to recognize that in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, from the time of Joseph Smith on, you are not required to believe anything. Not required to believe anything? No. Your behavior is what, what is important in the church. Uh, we have, there, there have been notable heretics over the years. Sterling McMurrin, I think, was one who his bishops wanted him excommunicated because he didn't believe. But the church leader said, it's not his belief, it's his behavior. And as long as he's not out promoting his heretical doctrines, we're not going to, we're not going to have a problem with that. So that is fundamentally different between us and I think the rest of, of, yeah. of oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Christianity is that you are not required to believe to be a member of the church. Now, uh, so the Articles also, of Faith, the articles Joseph, of, Joseph Smith, the Exaltation. Uh, you can say, I, well, you can disbelieve them. Now, so you're not going to go say, to the temple. So I can say I'm a Mormon? Sure. I know lots of Mormons that do. Say that they're Mormons, but they don't believe these things. Yeah. But, but, but how can you take that seriously and have a community well, that is cult- identifiable? They're, they're, they're cultural Mormons, and they're, you know... Like, oh, yeah, we know about we, them. We talk about <laughs> cultural Muslims. <laughs> well, yeah, right, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, I, 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 I know, but, but there's got to be a fundamental difference between seeing someone who says... If, if I said I'm a Muslim and I don't, do not believe in the Quran, I do not believe that Muhammad was a prophet, what does that mean? I mean and if you say you're a Mormon and you don't believe Joseph Smith, Smith is a prophet, Muslim. you don't believe in exaltation of godhood, you're, you're mumbling words, but they don't yeah, mean anything. That's true. Uh, they're cultural Mormons. Uh, they're not going to be um, uh, speaking in general conference. They're not going to be uh, bishops and stake presidents. And uh, You know, you might have a high councilman every once in a while who who shows up with uh, some odd ideas. When those odd ideas come about, he'll be released. Um, but not excommunicated? No. Not as long as their behavior isn't, uh, uh, isn't inappropriate. Doesn't that speak to what would be, I would consider to be a major problem because you are allowing the lines to not be clearly drawn, which... I would think muddles that central core. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, if, well, if uh, okay, well, you know, let's say that there's a hope that, that people will repent and change the way they think. Repent behaviorally or, or belief wise? Because you're making a distinction between the two. Well, my personal belief is that behavior and theology go hand in hand. They, they have to. That. Um, that if you are an active Latter-day Saint, uh, you will, by instinct, follow the teachings of the, of the gospel throughout the whole Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, uh, I missed one, oh, and the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> missed one, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, uh, but people, people can apostatize without being excommunicated as long as they're not uh, trying to, to rally uh, other apostates around them. What would you say if I said that I see a built-in inherent weakness in the LDS understanding of revelation that renders the entire system subject to what I think is going to be a, an inability to pass on what you and I talked about outside the South Gate the first time we spoke. So in other words, you and I were dealing with central issues about who Christ was, so on and so forth. 
those definitional doctrines, King Follett discourse and all the related issues to it, what if I said there is something in the subjectivity both of the testimony and of the concept of continuing revelation and your own statement of, a, of an element of not humanity but imperfection not just in the reception of the revelation, but how the, but how it's perceived. How it's perceived. Mm-hmm. Um, that is going to, and it, it already is, resulting in a tremendous widening of the understandings of Mormonism represented within the church. I see. Maybe you don't see it, or maybe I just don't have a good enough view that you have, being right there in the middle of it. But I see the, the Mormonism of 1983 was like this. Now, I would say the Jehovah's Witnesses of 1983 was like that. Very, very narrow. Every Jehovah's Witness you talked to believed exactly the same thing. There has been a slight widening in that. But if Mormonism was this in 1983, it's this now. In my, in my talking with people, I, I, I was stunned recently in talking to a Mormon fellow and I, I just started, and he's, he's like, oh, yeah, you, boy, that, that seer stone thing, isn't that interesting? You know, I mean, the church has now published all that and, and so on and so forth. And, and sure, Joseph Smith had, you know, he had a false prophecy here, false prophecy there. But, but you know, uh, the important thing was his honesty and stuff like that. We don't have to really worry about the specifics. And I'm sitting here going, where, where, I would too. <laughs> where did you come Yeah, you know, where did you come from? And, and this, is, this was someone who's actively involved in the church. And so I've seen that expansion. And here's my question. From our perspective, what, what we believe keeps us in light, because see, our society is trying to aid that expansion. Yeah. It wants to see that go all the way till there's no meaningful content to what we're saying that can possibly bring conviction of sin or anything else. They want to see that happening. And so the very educational system is meant to imbue in the minds of our children, if we hand them over to Caesar to be trained, uh, that kind of skepticism that's going to automatically result in that. So we do everything we can, and we recognize there is a core that has to be believed to define a person as a follower of Jesus Christ. And as you know, we disagree as to who Jesus Christ was and to what his intentions were. You, you said we agree on these things, but you know we, agree that we believe Jesus Christ has eternally been God and not the, no exaltation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those are fundamental differences. We have something that holds this together. Does Mormonism in especially, and, and we would say it's our doctrine of God, the fact that he is unchanging and eternal keeps that from, from, from expanding. But you don't have an unchanging and eternal God. Actually, there are scriptures do say that uh, as they, God, they, he is unchanging and As eternal. God, but mm-hmm. fundamentally, in light of the development of doctrine, would you agree that there's been a development of doctrine since even the last, uh, even the last revelations of Joseph Smith? Uh, I think there has been a, a codification that didn't include development? Um, um, I don't know. Are we out of time now? Go as long as you want. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, who what who is, is that there? man? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's behind the curtain. <laughs> uh, that was a long question. In fact, you started out with a question a long time ago. I know. We, I know. We, I'm we, sorry. I'm trying, we, to, we I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get um, to something that I've never heard anyone talk about. Uh-huh. And what and, and, and what I'm what I'm what I want to get your response to, and then I would like to please make sure that we do this as well. I, I, I do want to before we finish hear from you what you would want that's best for me to do and to believe, and I'll share the same thing for you. Okay, I, I want to do that before we finish up. Okay, um, because some people say that when you have just dialogues like this then the real issues get lost. And I, I don't want that to happen. I want, us, I want us to be able to say that. But what I'm saying is last night in the debate, Jeff and I said that the triune God 
of Christianity is, necess- is the necessary foundation for epistemology. That's what we tried to get them to engage on, and, and we got pressed on. Um, but... Uh, well, in, in fact, on that point, I was on their side. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, that, and that says something right there. Well, maybe I better clarify. I think that the question was, uh, or the, the, the premise was question-begging badly. Why? Um, that the triune God of the Bible exists. Um, that's that's, that's yeah, what we are defending. Yeah, yeah but... but uh, in discussing that with an atheist, mm-hmm. uh, there's a kind of a presuppositional perspective that they're not going to consider for a moment. Uh, I, I think if you're going to have a debate on does the uh, does the triune God uh, does try? Oh, this is hard to. Do, do you know? To, do you know why we emphasize that? Oh yeah. It, well, well, go ahead. Fundamentally, it is because the fact that we do not defend general theism because we do not find general theism to be a rational position to defend. You have to know what God you're saying is the foundation of all things. And we believe the fact that God is triune answers many of the key objections to general theism, which is basically, you know, how can God be communicative? It's, it's the one in the many problem in philosophy. And so we are emphasizing the fact that there is a specific God that we are going to defend, not just a general, okay. uh, uh, bare, the, the term that other atheists have used is bare theism, which ends up sounding very strange, because, but, but a, a bare theistic perspective. So that's why we emphasize the terminology that we do. Okay. So, but uh, I didn't mean to go into the last night's debate. My, my, my point is, if I said to you, that there is an inherent built-in problem in light of the nature of God in Mormonism that renders the system, that renders the entire religion almost defenseless against the onslaught of a secularizing society that's changing the subjective thinking of our young people. Whether, whether we try to keep them out of the educational system, whether we try, we can't protect them from everything, all the input that they're getting that is changing their subjective way of thinking. How would you respond to that? Uh, I would disagree strongly. I think that the, the LDS perspective of who God is, is true. Um, the philosophical underpinnings of either theological concept cannot be maintained if one of them is false. If one of, if one of those ideas is false. If, if your concept of the triune God and I wouldn't say of the Bible, but I would right. say of Nicene Christianity, I don't think is logically uh, defensible. But I do think that the God of Mormonism is the God of the Bible. Okay. So I, uh, I, don't, I, I, I think that there is going to be a period of apostasy, reformation, uh, just like you read in the Book of Mormon, among society, you're going to have uh, people that will um, lose their faith, that will abandon the faith of their fathers. Uh, but that is not going to change the foundational doctrines of the church. Now, I, you see some, some um, ancillary ideas. For example, it, it almost seemed like your perspective of us embracing other New Testament translations is somehow fatal to our theology. It's not. I mean, I've... But I, but I think the bringing in of the methodology behind that, when it is applied to the LDS scriptures, will inevitably lead to the necessity of the spiritualization of the historicity of the Book of Mormon, and, and especially, and especially the Book of Abraham. Yeah, I disagree. Uh, and I think you'll find that those people uh, who are writing these commentaries are true blue, through and through, uh, doctrinally sound scholars of Mormonism. If the Lord 
gives us another decade of life. And Jason is still trying to cause problems up here in Utah. Did you hear that laugh? Yes. I love it. It's like Dudley, what was that? Dudley, Dudley Do-Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't Dudley Do-Right. No, it, it, it was, it was, it was slightly whiplash. Snidely, oh, okay, yeah. that's what it is. Okay, yeah, yeah whatever. Uh, it's been a while. I'm sorry. Thank you for the assistance down front. If we have, if we have, if we have 10 years and we sit here and still have the freedom to do this 10 years from now, and you are seeing publication of spiritualized understandings of the Book of Mormon. Under the printing press of the church. Under the, or it, for sale at Deseret Book. Well, I don't know. What I, are you going to say? I bought my New International Bible uh, at Deseret Book. Well, I, you know who else they had at Deseret Book yesterday? Michelle Obama's book. What? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. But the, the point is, if we're here 10 years from now and... Do they have Donald Trump's books? I don't know. I didn't, I didn't look. Um, but if this is happening, and I have reason to believe it currently is, but if that is the case, what is the... Where, is your, where, do, you, where, do, you, where does Alma Allred draw the line? Uh, I have... Because you just said there could be apostasy. Yeah. What would you from, do? The, the church itself will not apostatize. It is, a, it is a... There were lots of people that left Joseph Smith. Oh, yeah. People can leave the church. People do all the time. What if there's a major split? How do you determine which one's right? Where's the, where's the dividing line? Well, actually, Joseph Smith gave a key on that. Okay. He said, uh, there will arise pretenders. There will be people who will try to draw factions away from the church. But he said, if you will observe these two facts, you will always follow the true church, whereas the majority of the saints and the records of the church are. The records of the church? <laughs> records as in? As in um, um, The records of, of priesthood ordinations, of baptisms, of uh, all of those records left Nauvoo with Brigham Young. So what if they become controlled by people who believe the Book of Mormon is not a historical record? It won't happen. So is, that an, is that a statement of faith? That's a, that's a statement of faith. Okay. All right. That's interesting. That's interesting. And, and when you say, where do you draw the line? Uh, my line is following the living prophet. I have confidence. No matter what. Yeah. I, I have confidence that he will not lead the church into apostasy. Is that any different than the Roman Catholic belief in the infallibility of the Pope? Yeah, significantly. Why? Um, I'd have to. I'd have to work on. Okay. That. All right. Yeah. That, that's. I. I that, yeah. that. I. I just. This is an interesting question. Okay. Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Well, I. I do want to ask this. Can I do one question? Just. The. The. The greatest desire. Of your heart for me, and I will start by expressing the greatest desire of my heart for you. Would that be fair? Sure. Sure. Okay. This is not a surprise since we've obviously discussed this type of thing for 30 some odd years, but it was 30 years ago. So it's, it's good, I think, to emphasize that, is that when we have these dialogues, you know I respect you as a person. You know that I enjoy these discussions. But you also know that I firmly believe that Joseph Smith was not bringing truth and that following him does not bring one into a proper relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so the reason we do what we do out of love for the LDS people is because we truly believe that you've been given a false gospel. And all the study that I do to try to accurately represent Mormonism and your beliefs is to show you respect as an individual but to allow me to be able to communicate where those issues are and to call you from what I believe is a soul-destroying position. Now, 
back in the 80s, many a Mormon would say, and I, and if you don't accept Joseph Smith as a prophet and the message of the church and be baptized under the proper authority, so on and so forth, you cannot have God's greatest. Some of them would say I would make the you know, terrestrial kingdom or something along those lines. Is that still where you would be? And what would your greatest... My, de, my desire is to see you know Jesus Christ as the eternal creator of all things. Not an organizer, not one who became a god, but the triune God is the basis and foundation of all things. Have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, um, knowing him in that way. What, is, what would be the greatest thing that you would want for me? Uh, that you would experience... the revelatory truth that Joseph Smith was called by God, that he was a true prophet of the living God, and that the doctrines that he taught are actually doctrines from God. Um, if you could experience that, I mean, now the thing is, is without that experience, I don't expect you to believe. But I can see a very real possibility that one day you come to a conclusion to ask God and that he reveals it to you. To ask God if Mormonism is true? Yeah. Okay. Well, not if Mormonism is true. If the Church of Jesus Christ will let me So it's true. If Joseph Smith was a true prophet. So Joseph Smith is the central aspect of that revelatory experience. Well, um, what I would say is that you cannot follow Jesus unless you accept those leaders that he has called. He that receiveth you receiveth me. And um, by understanding and accepting the mission of the prophet Joseph Smith, you will have a greater understanding of the mission of the Savior of the world. One last brief question. If the leadership of the church ever got to the point of engaging in ecumenical activity to where there was an acceptance of other ways, would that mean the end of Mormonism? Uh, you mean other ways, such other, as... Other... Uh, the, the validity of other Christian denominations. Let's just leave with Christian denominations. I'm not even talking about Mormonism, uh, of Islam or Buddhism or whatever. Well, the thing is, is I think your Christian, your Christian denomination is valid. I don't think it's authorized. <laughs> valid, but not authorized. Uh, my perspective is... <laughs> Well, there's, but there's only one true church, the church and lamb, the church of the devil, right? Uh, yeah. Um, so if you don't have the priesthood, which one are you in? You're in the church of the devil. There you go. Okay. Um, but but validly so, evidently. Well, no. <laughs> but the thing is, 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 it isn't an all or nothing perspective. I believe that you have truth. I think you do good for members of your congregation. In fact, I would consider you a Christian. I know you don't consider me a Christian but I consider Jason a Christian. I consider Jehovah's Witnesses Christians because they claim to be disciples of Jesus Christ. So, so who Jesus is does not define who a Christian is. No. Yeah, so that's, one of the, that's, yeah. a, that's a major yeah, it, it, difference between us, yes. Um, our perspective, um, you consider a Christian someone who is saved. Yes, someone who has been redeemed, redeemed. by, be regenerated by the work of the Holy Spirit of God, yes. Um, I think you're a Christian, but I don't think you've been redeemed by the Holy Spirit. Same. So we, we have, have a, a different, different perspective. Of well, we what have a very different terminology, yeah. no two ways yeah. about it. Yes. Um, I, I, I don't see Christian as a term of fellowship. I see it as a, a, a particular theology. And if you claim to follow Jesus Christ, I'm more than happy for you to claim the, uh, the, the name, name Christian. I'd, I'd love to go into what Paul said about that, but uh -huh. we've been asked to uh, uh, finish okay. up. So uh, 
When Jason is on the edge of his seat, that's generally an indication that we've, we've yeah. We have about 11 minutes uh, to okay. the hour. Um, any closing statements from either of you? Well, that was, that was sort of my, was, my closing. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah, I'm good there. First one for Dr. White. Uh, can your, does your church have the authority to ordain women elders? No church has the authority to ordain women elders because the authority for ordination comes from the revelation of God in Scripture, and the qualifications of the elders are laid out in uh, 1 Timothy and Titus, and those qualifications are specifically for men. So if you were to ordain someone outside of those parameters, you're going outside of Scripture, uh, and uh, adding to Scripture. So, now you all have already added to Scripture, so a real good question here is there is a um, recent development as of two days ago that seems to reflect a internal movement of egalitarianism within uh, Mormonism. Do you ever foresee a, a female in the priesthood? Uh let me let me back up a little bit. To, you may you want know, to run, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's an open door right over there. Actually, uh, the the change that was announced is uh, is that women may serve as witnesses. Right. Um, you may be surprised to know that in 1843, I think it was. It may have been as early as 1841 when Joseph Smith first preached about baptism for the dead. A group of people went down to the Mississippi River and did some baptisms for the dead. They did have two witnesses. It was a woman and the horse upon which she was sitting. <laughs> uh, so actually one of the first instances was a woman witness. Uh, but that was not the general... No, that was not the general process. And when I was in high school, uh, those who gave opening and closing prayers in sacrament meeting had to be priesthood holders. Mm -hmm. It was just a practice. Um, um, but you don't see anything moving that direction? No. I don't. Okay. All right. The, the follow-up question actually is, does, uh, Mr. Allred, does your church have the authority to change that and ordain women to the priesthood? Is there anything prohibiting uh, the church from making that change? Uh, can they receive a revelation to that effect? Um. I think from our perspective, it's a, it's a possibility. Um, and, and I say that if, I don't know how, what kind of access people could have to the Reed Smoot hearings, but uh, the president of the LDS Church, Joseph F. Smith, was on the stand under oath, and they talked about whether or not women have priestly authority. And uh, that's a very interesting uh, discussion. He, uh, he points out that uh, women serve in the Relief Society, that it is um, an organization designed to minister to the sick and the afflicted. And the senator asks him, well, do you see that as a priesthood duty? And he said, I absolutely do. Um, so it's an open question. Okay, uh, for Dr. White, uh, does your church have the authority to uh, recognize uh, gay marriage? Well, once again, uh, when you say, does your church have authority, we believe that the only authority we have is derived from our faithfulness to the revelation of God in Scripture. And our Lord and Savior defined what marriage was in Matthew chapter 19, it is a man and a woman, and it has been so from the beginning, and therefore there is no authority in heaven and earth higher than that of Jesus Christ, and so anyone who would define a marriage differently is defying his authority. And so we certainly would not have that authority, um, and we would actually say that no one has that authority. Um, and um, so, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Part two? <laughs> Have you not read that he which made them in the beginning made them male and female and said? Can, can the 
Can the LDS Church, though, uh, in light of uh, changes with polygamy, blacks in the priesthood, can they receive a revelation uh, that would uh, recognize uh, gay marriage? Okay, by what standard? Can Utah do it? Oh, yeah, Utah, I think, already has to have it. It's, you know, it's the law of the land, but it's not the law of the church. Can, uh, and then just as a, I'm trying to tie together a number of different questions. Uh, if the church uh, that has the largest number of members and the records uh, embraces that, and I realize that may be like, a square circle in your thinking, but if they do embrace uh, gay marriage, is there some standard by which you can say that they are wrong? Um, I think it's in, entirely too much of a hypothetical. Um, I don't think that it could ever occur. You look at 20 years ago when the church uh, issued their proclamation on the family, it was pretty direct and I think it was prophetic in what we were going to face. You look at the proclamation on the family, and it is very insistent that marriage is between a man and a woman, and that children are best reared in that environment. Um, that even though society may very well be going to hell, uh, the church is not going to join it in that respect at all. If 10 years from now that changes, what is well, Alma already? Saying it's, it's not going to change. Okay, all right. You can take that to the bank. Dr. White, can a practicing homosexual be a member in good standing of your church? Hey, Jeff, would you like to come down and join with this? Since it uh, seems to be uh, Luke, Zach, we, we've got all, all the pastors here. Um, uh, no, uh, because uh, we have a, a doctrinal, biblical, and confessional standard that defines what sexual sin is and uh, what repentance is. And so could you have someone who has repented of sexual sin and, and these types of things? Uh, obviously, but that, that issue of repentance is, is key. To be under the lordship of Christ is to accept his authority to define these things. And therefore, uh, we are under his authority. We're just under shepherds. We don't uh, we, we believe the church hears the voice of Christ uh, in his word, and that is always our ultimate authority. The folks here and those watching live stream, you can quit texting me because we cannot stay here till 12. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Allred, You're going to be I, changing your number by tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Scotch-Irish. We don't, we don't spend money <laughs> easily. Um, Mr. Allred, as of April, the LDS Church Handbook no longer characterizes uh, same-sex marriage as, uh, by a member as apostasy. Uh, if it is not apostasy, what is it? Iniquity. Can someone be a member in good standing in the LDS Church and be a practicing homosexual? No. So it's... Could you, I mean, you, you could want to trade places and go ahead and give the same answer that you gave. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, but why the change in the manual? Just in the, in the terminology. Um, because there are certain sins that are not considered apostasy. They're considered sins. Why was it apostasy before, though? Um, I think initially it's because variations on marital status before the last 20 years was primarily fu uh, fundamentalism, uh, an attempt to, uh, polygamy. to, to live polygamy. And, that, uh, and in fact, the policies that were implemented followed the policies that regarded children of fundamentalism. Children of polygamous f families were not allowed to be baptized. Mm. And uh, I think when, when all of a sudden you got a different view of marriage, the church said, this is going to be viewed as the same perspective. But can, 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 I, can I make everybody in the audience really angry? I've got to get your opinion on this. In light of Obergefell, um, Alito, in his dissent, said that if we do this, polygamy is next. If he was right, am I right 
in guessing that the leadership in Salt Lake is scared to death that that would happen? Not at all. You think they'd like it? No, no. In fact, I, I think it would, it would be a non-issue to them. Um, polygamists would not be allowed to be, to be baptized. Um, those who attempt to take plural wives would be excommunicated. Um, Even if it became the law of the land that you could do it? It's the law of the land in many countries in Africa. They're not allowed to be baptized if they're practicing polygamists. Even in light of Section 132? Yeah. It's because the president of the church controls the keys of the sealing power and... And could undo the suspension. He could. But I would say the church would not be concerned about it. I, I would not be surprised if 30 years from now marriage has basically will have dis- disappeared as a social institution. It's um, happening in Europe. Yeah. yeah. And who knows, it may be down the road that if, if women want to be married, they may have to pick a man that is already married. And if the church makes that decision, they could do that, but it, would be irris- it, it, it wouldn't have anything to do with any uh, Supreme Court decisions right now. Well, we are past 9 o'clock, and so uh, I think our speakers are going to stick around for a little bit if you have additional questions. But please join with me in thanking both our speakers for being kind enough to join us this evening. Thanks again. I really appreciate it.